is a production of Cornell University. Thank you, Gillian, for the honor to introduce Maureen Hansen, who's a, <clears throat> excuse me, a perfect choice to give the SIPS plenary lecture today. Maureen, who is a Liberty Hyde Bailey professor here at Cornell, has joint appointments in the Department of Molecular Biology and Genetics and in plant biology. So she's probably well known to many of the people here, but I thought I'd provide a few background details of her stellar career. Maureen has been interested in plant biology for a long time, beginning with majoring in plant biology as an undergraduate at Duke, continuing with her graduate work at Harvard with Larry Bogorod on um, chloroplasts and their ribosomes, and then her postdoctoral work with Fred Ausubel, also at Harvard. She then took a faculty position at the University of Virginia before moving to Cornell as an associate professor in 1985. Maureen's lab has made a dazzling set of important contributions to our understanding of biology in general and plant biology in particular. Her work is um, notable for, for, doing, for connecting very high level fundamental biology with potential applications in literally in the field. One of her lab's earliest contributions was on the basis for cytoplasmic male sterility in plants. Using petunias as a model system, um, Maureen's lab showed that the causative agent was a gene fusion expressed in mitochondria, and then went on to identify a nuclear gene that restored fertility, the first member of the PPR group of proteins that are now common fertility restorer genes uh, in cases of CMS. So that was beautiful, but in a completely different area, Maureen's GFP labeling in her lab revealed that there were tubules that connect plastids like chloroplasts um, that she called stromules and allow the transit of proteins and other molecules between chloroplasts and also play a role in plant disease. And that was beautiful too but in a completely different area at the same time, she and her lab also elucidated mechanisms by which plasmids edit the sequences of their mRNAs, changing about 600 cytosines in mitochondria and about 30 or 40 in chloroplast to um, uracils, which of course changes the protein uh, nature that's, that's coded for that. So she worked on this and also identified the many of the components of the editosome complex that makes these changes. And that interestingly include PPR proteins like the res, um, fertility restorer that she had previously identified. That was nice too, but in a completely different fourth area, she works on Rubisco and, um, and that will be the subject of her talk today. So you'll hear about that in a moment. So I just have a couple of more things to say. Maureen has, uh, with her about 25 grad students and about 25 postdocs, published over 200 papers, many in top journals. Um, her work is incredibly highly regarded in many, many fields, and she has received a lot of awards and recognition for her work. Just a few are that um, she's a fellow of the AAAS. She's received awards from SUNY, from CALS, from the American Society for Plant Biology, and last year was elected a week apart to the National Academy of Sciences and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. On top of all this, Maureen has played major administrative roles in her discipline as an editor, as a conference chair on grants panels, et cetera, and in fostering plant biology at Cornell, including 13 years directing the Cornell Plant Science Center and its training grants and innovative programs. So she's really, really incredibly amazing. That was plant Maureen. In addition to all of this work on plants, Maureen has an equally important, equally big and equally impactful research initiative on something completely unrelated to plants, specifically the etiology of myalgic encephalitis, which is also known as chronic fatigue syndrome. In studies with physicians, physical therapists, population geneticists, and others, she has identified metabolic phenotypes in ME-CFS patients, 
including in their mitochondria, in their plasma proteins, in their immune system, and differences in their microbiome. These are human patients here. Her work has shown that MECFS is a metabolic disease, not a psychological one, critically important in these times. And she has, uh, her work is revealing ways to diagnose or alleviate this disease. She also has a great deal of communication with the public about it. Some of the work that I um, mentioned on this comes from a $9.4 million NIH funded collaborative center that she heads here to investigate the pathophysiology of MECFS. So um, as you can hear, Maureen has touched incredibly well, many, many, many different fields, plants and not plants. And it's really an honor for, her, for us to hear her talk about um, how to improve photosynthetic carbon assimilation in plants. Thank you, Maureen. Well, that um, introduction is gonna be a hard act to follow. <laughs> but it's also my first seminar in person since uh, January 2020 when I was in San Diego uh, for the plant and animal genome meeting. And uh, it's, it's really interesting to see all these non-smiling faces wearing masks <laughs> out there. So, uh, okay, so I guess I better get started. And isn't it nice that, that it actually looks like this? Normally when I show this photo, it doesn't look like that in Ithaca. So I wanna do a brief reminder about C3 carbon fixation uh, before I start. This is of course well known to many people in the room, but let me just remind you that Rubisco is the enzyme that's responsible for combining RUBP and CO2 to create two three carbon molecules that then are utilized in the uh, Calvin cycle, resulting in all those nice products that we get in plants, uh, sugar, starch, amino acids, and fatty acids. But Rubisco can react with oxygen instead of CO2. And when that happens, we have photorespiration in which a one toxic two carbon molecule and one three carbon molecule are produced, then resulting in the release of CO2, loss of energy and fixed carbon and production of ammonia. So Rubisco is an issue. It limits photosynthetic efficiency in two different ways. Uh, not only by photorespiration, but also it has a very slow catalytic rate. Only three molecules of CO2 fixed per second in a typical plant, uh, uh, flowering plant. And then also as a result of this slow turnover rate, we have 25 to 50% of the total leaf soluble protein is actually Rubisco and that uses up 25% of the leaf nitrogen. So there is a big issue with Rubisco and it's a target for improvement. So we're taking two strategies to enhance Rubisco efficiency. And I'm going to give my talk in two parts. The first part is uh, an effort to create a new plant subcompartment to increase the concentration of CO2 near Rubisco. And that's the first uh, topic I will go over. So some photosynthetic organisms have involved ways to deal with this problem of Rubisco. And these are shown here. There's the C4 pathway, the CAM pathway, the pyrenoid, and the carboxysome. And all of these put more CO2 in the vicinity of Rubisco to assist with this problem of photorespiration and also uh, uh, increase the uh, efficiency. So we actually decided to focus on the carboxysome as a strategy to um, uh, improve uh, photosynthetic carbon assimilation. We had, have had a grant uh, from a special program at NSF, an NSF BBSRC program uh, for synthesis of these micro compartments. And this is a collaboration with Lancaster University uh, with Elizabeth Carmo Silva and Martin Perry, the PIs and Doug Orr, the senior postdoc, and with the University of Glasgow with Mike Blatt. Uh, at Cornell, uh, this work has been done by Miat Lin, Vishal Chowdhury, and Kevin Hines, who is a BMCB student who has now graduated and moved to Northeastern. And we had a 2018 uh, REU student. Uh, and Vishal and Miat are here and uh, uh, available to answer questions, which is uh, always uh, helpful. So cyanobacteria avoid photorespiration with this 
CO2 concentrating microcompartment, the, carbonic, uh, the carboxy cell. In this, the rubisco is enclosed within this compartment along with carbonic anhydrase. So that carbonic anhydrate, uh, bicarbonate enters, con is converted to CO2, and then the rubisco has an enriched CO2 atmosphere uh, in order uh, to carry out its uh, carbon fixation. This is what these carboxysomes actually look like uh, in, in the cyanobacterium. So the question then is, can we take this cyanobacterial carbon concentrating mechanism and put it into plants? So here is the diagram in, in the cyanobacteria. You see that bicarbonate is pumped in into this, uh, into this compartment. The idea is to transfer the carboxysome structure into, into a chloroplast. And this is not uh, entirely accurate because you need more than one carboxysome. You need, you need hundreds of carboxysomes in there and you'd need your pump uh, in, in order to get all of this to work. The modeling was done by a, a former collaborator of ours, Steve Long's group, and that showed that if you could actually achieve this, the potential increase in yield would be as much as 60%. Now, we've published a number of papers about producing the structure of the carboxysome, and I'm not going to describe these here since they're all published, uh, uh, but this work is uh, being continued by our collaborators in Lancaster. Uh, and, and actually our current grant ends in December and they will continue that work and we're going to be doing something else that I will, related that I will tell you about. So one issue is that the carbonic anhydrase in the chloroblast must be confined to the carboxysome. It's not confined right now because there is carbonic anhydrase in, naturally in the chloroplast of plants. But it was shown uh, by a group some years ago that if you put carbonic anhydrase into the cytoplasm of cyanobacteria, that prevents the carboxysome from working uh, because the problem is the CO2 is then released in the cytoplasm instead of within the carboxysome. So we potentially would have the same problem in the plant if we were to put a carboxysome in there. So clearly we need to remove uh, the chloroplast stromal carbonic anhydrase uh, in order to have the carboxysome to work. So the question though is, what happens if all the carbonic anhydrase is removed from the chloroplast stroma? Is this gonna do something bad to the plant? This hasn't been done to, in the past, but when we started to remove all of the carbonic anhydrase from the chloroplast. Now, the role of carbonic anhydrase in C4 photosynthesis is understood, but we're working on C3 photosynthetic plants. In C4 photosynthesis, the, uh, the carbonic anhydrase is responsible for, for uh, conversion between CO2 and bicarbonate, which is then used to make oxaloacetate. And then malate is, uh, sent in, is converted from that and <coughs> sent in to the bundle sheet to carry out C4 photosynthesis. So we understand why there's carbonic anhydrase uh, in the chloroplasts of uh, uh, C4 plants but we don't really know why it's present in C3 plants. We don't know what the role of carbonic anhydrase in photosynthesis would be, but it's always been thought that it had a role in C3 photosynthesis. Uh, in 1994, Dean Price's lab removed uh, most of the chloroplast carbonic anhydrase using anti-sense technology. They got down to 2% of the normal chloroplast carbonic anhydrase activity in some of their plants, their anti-sense plants, which was the state-of-the-art technology at the time. They didn't see any effect on a, a carbon assimilation or leaf dry weight or chlorophyll. The problem with this study is that carbonic anhydrase is one of the most efficient enzymes. And even just 2% of carbonic anhydrase could have a very important effect on the plant. So you really need to remove all of it if you're going to understand its effect. When you drink a soda, by the way, and you get those bubbles released in your mouth, that's your, that's your saliva carbonic anhydrase releasing the CO2. And it happens almost instantly as you just take one drink and, and have the CO2 released. So uh, Kevin labeled uh, uh, the uh, uh, the uh, chloropl putative chloroplast carbonic anhydrases with uh, 
uh, with YFP to verify uh, that these indeed were chloroplast carbonic anhydrases. And you can see these, these bodies here are chloroplasts. And you can see these are those, those tubules that Mariana mentioned in the introduction here that we uh, re uh, rediscovered in 1997. And it was my pleasure to have Patricia Conklin, who is a G former GGD student, who's now a SUNY full professor, SUNY Cortland uh, full professor, come and do a sabbatical with me and actually work on these stromules. And uh, we have a, a recent article, if you're interested in these, uh, describing the current state of what we know about stromules. But that's an aside. Let me get back to carbonic anhydrase. So there are zinc binding residues in carbonic anhydrase that are known to be essential for the enzymatic activity. And so Kevin Hines sent out to use CRISPR Cas9 to knock out the carbonic anhydrase genes uh, in plant in uh, tobacco that are, are, are make proteins that are targeted to the chloroplast. So he designed uh, he designed constructs that had two targets with the idea that you would get a nice deletion. And here's an example of such a deletion that was created by uh, by CRISPR Cas9. However, this is the exception because this actually did not work very well, and instead we actually got mainly mutants that had small deletions or point mutations. Nevertheless, we were able to mutagenize the two chloroplast uh, carbonic anhydrase genes uh, with, uh, by doing this. These uh, single mutants have completely normal morphology. So this is, happens to be CA1 uh, knocked out and the, this is CA5. And the morphology is, is uh, as far as you can see, it looks just uh, like a regular uh, you know, tobacco plant. However, the mute, double mutant that knocks out both of them is abnormal even on sucrose medium. So it looks like this, it's barely uh, getting along uh, in sucrose medium. But if you transfer it to high CO2, and this is the maximum CO2 that we can actually put in our growth chambers over in Wild Hall, because uh, any more than that, OSHA says you might stick your head in and get asphyxiated. So, so this, is what we, this is what we can give them. And this, um, uh, this, is, this normalization is likely because there's some spontaneous conversion of bicarbonate and CO2 that at high CO2 drives the reaction uh, uh, to give you enough bicarbonate. And if you transfer that plant back into uh, low CO2, you then uh, end up with uh, plants looking very abnormal again, but they do survive because they're being fed by these leaves here that, that were formed during the, uh, during the high CO2. So by, uh, Kevin then went on to assay uh, carbonic anhydrase activity and he was having trouble getting a source of uh, uh, carbonated water. So I had to bring in my soda stream, uh, which is what he used to, to make the, carbon, to the carbonated water to do the assay. And you can see that when you knock out CA1, there's very little CA activity left. CA5, there's not a whole lot of uh, effect of that because CA5 is obviously not one of the more important uh, proteins. But if you knock both of them out, then there's very little CA activity. So we then uh, went to our colleague, Tom Owen, so I don't see here, although maybe he is online, uh, because he was a great help, uh, in fact, essential for this study because uh, he, uh, he actually did these experiments uh, uh, with Kevin to look at PS2 efficiency uh, to find out whether there is actually any impairment in photosynthesis. And uh, given Tom's exper expertise, he assured us that th these graphs showing really no difference between the single mutant, the double mutant and wild type really reveals that there's no effect on photosynthesis. However, unfortunately, some reviewers didn't agree that Tom knew what he was doing and instead said, oh no, you have to do carbon assimilation experiments as well. And for that, we're grateful that Michelle got involved in this project and performed these experiments showing that even at low uh, oxygen, where there's very little photo, photorespiration or at atmospheric levels of oxygen, there's, you really cannot distinguish the double mutant from the wild type. And so this again is further evidence that there's really no effect on 
uh, there's no effect on uh, photosynthesis of removing the, uh, the carbonic anhydrase. So this is, uh, was breaking a paradigm. So it took us quite a while to get this published. In fact, almost two years to get this published because, because it wasn't believed. But now, fortunately, uh, it is out and, and you can read it uh, in PNAS. So why do chloroplasts need stromo-localized uh, carbonic anhydrase for this normal leaf development? It turns out that bicarbonate is a substrate for biosynthetic pathways in chloroplasts. And these are just two of those biosynthetic pathways. There's about a half a dozen biosynthetic pathways that need bicarbonate. So if you don't, if you don't uh, have bicarbonate present, there, and, or these pathways are, are not going to function properly. In fact, this has, con uh, this has consequences that you can see easily. Even when, with those antisense plants, it was shown back in 2002 that the, uh, uh, that the incorporation of acetate into chloroplast lipids was reduced. So lipid synthesis in the chloroplast was reduced even in the plants that had uh, 2% and were totally normal looking. Uh, our plants that are very unhappy looking uh, definitely have a disturbed lipid profile uh, in, the, in double mutant leaves as assayed uh, over in the BRC here. And so, uh, so this is evidence of biochemical disruption as, the, as a result of the absence of bicarbonate. The phenotype of the plant is also uh, very abnormal. And this isn't what tobacco is supposed to look like. Let Drosophila geneticists know that this isn't, isn't what tobacco reproduction looks like. Normally, this is, these buds have, there have been buds that have, ex, have fallen off of, of, these, uh, of this tobacco uh, in, in ambient CO2. Once in a while, a bud will make it and make some seeds, but it's, most of them fall off. And the seeds that develop uh, uh, in ambient CO2 here are also sort of hollowed out and very abnormal. You can imagine if lipid synthesis is impaired that, that this would, this would uh, result in, in an abnormal seed. So, uh, so what about complementation? Uh, we did complement this using the 30 by FES promoter, complement it with CA1. And the complementation shows that you get complete normalization of the phenotype uh, when you complement with a normal carbonic anhydrase protein. However, uh, a, if you make a CA protein with the gene that, that lacks the chloroplast transit sequence, in other words, this carbonic anhydrase is synthesized, but it's <coughs> remaining in the, in the cytoplasm, it's not going into the chloroplast, then you get no complementation. And as a further uh, demonstration that you need enzymatic activity for this normalization, uh, Kevin made a uh, mutant protein mutated in that uh, zinc uh, site and put that into the plant. And again, there was no complementation uh, when um, there's a mutation in the active site. Now, one problem about using a plant that doesn't have um, CA1 in it is that it's actually known to do something else. It's actually a salicylic uh, acid binding protein required for the hypersensitive response. So uh, I think most people here know that uh, a hypersensitive response defends against virus. Uh, as it, uh, this program, cell death, prevents the spread of virus. And so if you had a plant lacking BCA1, you'd expect it to be sensitive to tobacco mosaic virus and potentially other viruses. But with Dan Klesig's help, Kevin did another experiment. And that was to see if he could express the inactivated BCA1 and get the hypersensitive response. And the answer is yes. So here's a wild type leaf uh, with, with a hypersensitive response lesion. BCA1 has no such lesion after being inoculated with TMV, nor does BCA1, uh, uh, the double mutant. Uh, the BCA5 still does have a, a hypersensitive response because it still has BCA1 present. But this, here's a lesion made uh, uh, in this plant that has the uh, uh, zinc uh, binding region uh, deleted. Uh, and so we can still get the hypersensitive response by putting in a BCA1 that has no carbonic anhydrase activity, but is still able to function in the salicylic acid 
signaling pathway and cause a hypersensitive response. So the question then is, will this abnormal plant development, I mean, CO2, when, uh, when CA is removed, prevent the production of plants with engineered carboxysomes? Uh, this, back to this diagram, we think that this is actually not going to be a problem because we need to do something else to make this, car this carbon concentrating mechanism work. And that is to put a pump on the chloroplast envelope, just like it's on the cyanobacterial uh, uh, membrane in order to get uh, the bicarbonate pumped in. Uh, thereby this bicarbonate could be used not only in the uh, carboxysome, but also for those biosynthetic pathways. So our current project now, we've been able to be refunded by NSF, and that's to in introduce bicarbonate transporters from microbes onto the chloroplast membrane. And that's a project that's gonna be started in January, uh, being carried out by Vishal Chowdhury. And um, we, uh, as, as uh, something that we, we have, it benefits this is we actually now have a bicarbonate requiring mutants. That's what those double mutant is. If we succeed in putting this pump on, then we're hoping we will be able to, to get a normalization of the plant phenotype. So uh, this, is, this is the summary of part one. And um, uh, I'll go over this really quickly, but I've shown you that tobacco uh, lacking stromal carbonic anhydrase has no abnormal growth and development, but that uh, doesn't impair photosynthesis. Uh, if, if we express uh, the CA in the uh, cytoplasm or inactivate it, we don't get the normal phenotype. And we believe that uh, by the CA's role is to supply bicarbonate to enzymes needed for biosynthetic processes. And we can restore the hypersensitive response with an enzymatically inactive CA1. And we think that the removal of the stromal CA should be feasible if bicarbonate pumps are installed on the chloroplast envelope. I now would like to move on to the second project, which is to mutagenize Rubisco to have higher turnover rate. Let me just again remind people, although many of you know this, that vascular plant Rubisco is comprised of subunits encoded by both the chloroplast and nuclear genome. The small subunit by the nuclear genome and the eight large subunits by a single gene that's present in the chloroplast genome. We can use chloroplast transformation to replace the plant RBCL by homologous recombination. And uh, this uh, procedure was worked out many years ago in Paul Mulligan's lab. The transformation vectors one uses typically carry a spectinomous mycin resistance marker. And this just shows the procedure that you need to carry out. You do, you do bombardment of your little seedlings. You, you regenerate resistant, uh, uh, antibiotic resistant ones. But you haven't transformed all of the chloroplast genome, so you have to do another round of selection. And then you have to check whether they're homoplasmic. In other words, so that you completely replaced all of the, the wild type genomes. And if you have, you can go to rooting and make a plant. So you need at least three to four months to do this procedure, maybe six months if you're unlucky. So, but we can do this. So how how do we alter Rubisco though for this improved enzymatic properties that we would like? So one possibility would be to identify amino acids that were altered in the C3 to C4 transition since C4 Rubisco is faster uh, and, and, and you know, potentially could improve, result in improved Rubisco. So 10 homoplasmic uh, RBCL mutants were actually produced and uh, they look fairly normal. Uh, and there was no effect on Rubisco abundance by making these mutations. Now the mutations that were put in were either one amino acid change or maybe two amino acid changes. However, these uh, mutations, uh, while they affected, uh, they, uh, affected enzyme kinetics, they didn't affect them in the right direction. They actually made the Rubisco worse. You can see here, that this is two different types of wild type. It's between 2.4 and 2.6. And in every case, the uh, kinetics are actually, uh, are actually worse in the mutant Rubisco. Um, so, so this is clearly not the greatest strategy. 
to, uh, to try to improve Rubisco. Uh, and the other problem with this strategy is that it takes so, if you wanted to test, say, 100 different Rubiscos, imagine the amount of work you'd have to do to put this into a plant. Well, fortunately, in 2017, there was a breakthrough in, in uh, Manajit Higher Hartle's lab in which he was for the first time able to assemble plant Rubisco and E. coli using five chloroplast chaperones. And when she did this, uh, put in a uh, she was able to get a Rabidopsis uh, Rubisco synthesized pretty well here, pretty good amount of uh, Rabidopsis Rubisco assembled. And by adding uh, one of the tobacco chaperones, she was able to get a little bit of uh, tobacco Rubisco assembled. Uh, this, however, would not be enough for our purposes. We wanted to use this system to express mutant Rubiscos and look at their kinetics. So Niat Lin uh, set out to improve the system and he converted the three plasmids into two and rearranged things. And I'm not gonna go into this. Uh, it's now published uh, and it's probably not of much interest, but the bottom line is that he was able to get a very good yield of assembled Rubisco by making these alterations in the chaperones used in the promoters, et cetera. So he went on to study uh, the seven unique small subunits that are encoded by the tobacco genome. Now tobacco is, is uh, an allotetraploid. So actually there are quite a number of um, uh, small subunits, either from the parental line Sylvesterus, designated S, or Tementosiformis, designated as T. Some of these uh, are pseudogenes. S3 looks like a pseudogene. Uh, this is the expression level in uh, young leaf or mature leaf, uh, according to uh, database data. And you can see that there are a number of well-expressed uh, Rubisco subunits at the RNA level. These seven uh, were then further studied. Now notice that there's a trichome Rubisco you wouldn't really expect there to be a, a, a Rubisco in trichomes, but it was discovered a few years ago that there's a trichome Rubisco that has a small subunit that's very different than the leaf subunits. You see all these changes, the red changes are different from leaf uh, Rubisco. So what it's doing, we don't really know, but uh, experiments with this trichome Rubisco indicates it, it has a lower affinity for CO2 and a faster catalytic rate. So the experiment that we wanted to do was to, to find out, uh, you know, what the properties of this, um, the enzymes produced in E. coli, did they really mimic the wild type E. coli or not? The wild type uh, Rubisco in plants or not? So in a plant, because there are multiple genes and multiple proteins around, there's multiple for proteins are likely to actually exist where you have multiple small subunits assembled into your Rubisco enzyme. But in E. coli, you're only, if you only express one of those small subunits, you're getting a very uniform enzyme. You're getting that single large subunit along with your single small, small subunit that you choose. So we can test the, the uh, enzyme efficiency with these different uh, small subunits. We can also find out if the unusual trichome Rubisco kinetics is also reproduced in E. coli. Well, this is the bottom line. Uh, it turns out indeed that the, the E. coli system is pretty good. The, case, the, uh, the KC and the KCAT are fairly similar to the native enzyme. So there's a little, it's a li there's a little bit lower affinity for CO2 uh, in the E. coli system, but it's not bad. And, there's, uh, and it looks like the trichome Rubisco kinetics is reproduced. So again, the KCAT is actually quite similar for most of these uh, uh, subunits when you express it in, uh, in E. coli. So this is good enough for us to go on and use to express mutant enzymes uh, in plants uh, in E. coli and then find out what their kinetics are. But the question is, how do we decide to make the mutations uh, in Rubisco, uh, given that just look, you know, mutating one or two didn't do much good. So another possibility, would be uh, to use information from ancient history and um, uh, almost to the time of the dinosaurs. Uh, and I put this slide here so I could have a chance to get a quick drink of water so you can enjoy the joke. 
I looked up and it turns out that dinosaurs actually have brains about the size of a lime, not a walnut. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so the idea is that Rubisco enzymes in C3 plants have evolved at a much lower uh, CO2 than is currently out there in the atmosphere. So 408 parts per million is what was the latest measurement uh, uh, in Hawaii. So, um, so we're, we're definitely higher than uh, uh, CO2 has been for quite a while. In fact, if you look here, this is when the dinosaurs uh, became extinct. There was a period of time here when there was much higher CO2 uh, than we have now. Uh, but, uh, but unfortunately, we're heading that way. And uh, so this might be a source of information. The ancestral enzymes that exist there might be a source of information for uh, valuable Rubisco enzymes. So the new strategy is to predict Rubisco enzymes that existed 20 to 30 million years ago in Solanaceae. And tobacco is a member of the Solanaceous family. These are just some uh, other, ver other uh, members of the family. I'd like to now give credit to Miat Lin. Uh, I'd like to take credit for this idea, but it wasn't mine. It was actually Miat's idea. Uh, he suggested it to me and I immediately thought, this is a great idea, we have to go do this. This opinion of mine, however, is, is uh, my only contribution to the idea is that I thought it was good, <laughs> unlike several sets of grant proposal reviewers who thought it was not such a good idea. And it's always a pleasure to pr prove grant proposal review is wrong. So Miat has spearheaded this project with only the help of a rotation student who spent a brief period in the lab and in our, a 2019 REU student. All the other work that I'm gonna present was done by Miat himself. So here's the predicted evolutionary timeline within Solnaceae. If you want to go back about 30 million years, the, this is where you can, this gives you an idea of the nodes where you can go back and find those ancestral enzymes. So the problem about this though, is that there were too few Rubisco small subunits to reliably predict the ancestral sequences. You know, there were only five genera that there were sequences available. And in, so in the NCBI database, this is all that was there. However, there were a lot of data in the, um, RNA-seq databases that could be mined. And this is what Miat did. He mined these databases. I'm not gonna go through this, there's not time. But the bottom line is by doing this, he was able to get some additional large subunits and a large number of additional small subunits. So he's now got 17 genera instead of five represented here. And, and uh, he's got some additional large subunits as well. Doing this, he was able to produce uh, a phylogenetic tree and predict a large number of ancestral enzymes. And in the subsequent slides, you're going to see these different nodes represented by different colors. So you've got orange, red, uh, uh, brown, and green. And what Miat did, which during the pandemic, was to express 98 of these predicted Rubisco enzymes, express them in E. coli and then characterize them by this rapid screening method. So the blue line is the bar above which the enzymes are showing some indication of being superior to the uh, wild type enzyme when it's expressed in E. coli. So these enzymes here are good candidates for further study. And in fact, Miat then selected 38 for full kinetic curves, uh, uh, which is of course a lot more work than this uh, initial screen in order to see if they also were superior. And indeed it turned out that this assay of ancestral enzymes revealed a number of them that have superior properties in comparison to present day Rubisco. So for example, here, this had, these enzymes have a higher uh, catalytic efficiency and also a higher turnover rate. So these are really uh, interesting candidates to uh, study more. And these could never have been predicted just by looking at the structure because these have multiple 10 or so amino acid changes. So to summarize part two, we can express plant Rubisco and E. coli 
we, we could study in the, the endogenous small subunits. Uh, Miat has obtained many more sequences of the large and small subunits, used that to construct a phylogenetic tree, expressed 98 of, of these enzymes in E. coli, and some of these definitely have improved catalytic efficiency. So what's our next step here? In my last slide, I'm gonna say our next step is to replace the endogenous rubisco with ancestral rubisco through chloroplast transformation. And that's the project that we'll be, we'll be doing this, this coming year. Thank you. Okay, we have two minutes before 110. I don't know if we're being thrown out there then or. Uh, uh, no. Uh, questions for Maureen? Um, Zoom audience, in-person audience? How does the carbonic unhydrate hinder the cap boxes on formation? Do you know? Do you know anything? No, I couldn't hear that. How does the carbonic unhydrate okay. uh, prevents the formation of um, cap boxes? Do you know? Oh, how does the how does the carbonic how does the anhydrase how does the carbonic anhydrase in the in this in the chloroplast? Why would that prevent formation? of, it doesn't prevent formation of the carboxysomes, it prevents the mechanism from working. So in the cyanobacteria, when they put carbonic anhydrase in the cytoplasm, which is of course the equivalent of the stroma, the problem was that the CO2 was released in the cytoplasm. It wasn't released inside the carboxysome. So you need to have the bicarbonate sitting around in the cytoplasm or the stroma, and then being transported by a pump into the carboxysome, where then the carbonic anhydrase inside the carbonic inside the carboxysome will release the CO2 for utilization by Rubisco. So that's why you have to get rid of it. This has been a production of Cornell University on the web at cornell.edu.